Davidson for seven years, but this is my first um, ACS function, and it's so cool to hear other people's way of doing the same things that we're trying to do and that we're struggling with. And some of the things, you know, you get so embedded in your own organization that you think, oh, I wonder why we do it that way. <laughs> so, um, well, one of the things that, that um, I thought I'd start with, which isn't in my presentation because I didn't really realize until I got here that it's, it's really pertinent, is I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background about the way we're structured and the people that are in our um, ITG and ITS function and, and just a little background. Um, as I said, I started in, nine, in 2006, so I've been there seven years. Um, I was the last one hired, so we've had no turnover. It's kind of amazing. Wow. Um, our ITG group is within ITS, and in fact, Murr, who I think many of you know, had my role prior to his being elevated to ITS, to the head of ITS. And my role is instructional technologist for math and the sciences. Mm -hmm. So we actually divide up our ITG function by the departments that you support. Um, and then we have an ITG person who's focused on foreign languages, and then Kristen, who's the head of our ITG, does um, economics, English, political science, some of those uh, social sciences. Um, Kristen, and this is, again, something I wouldn't have thought to mention before, but Kristen is actually married to a librarian at Johnson & Wales, which is a different university down in Charlotte. And that absolutely, I think, um, colors her perspective and always has. Um, and then, as I said, Murr, was in my role mm -hmm. prior to me, so he certainly, absolutely sees the value in partnering with, uh, with faculty and the, and the role that we play. So that's just a little bit of history. The, um, the only turnover that, that we've had is the fellow that we get every year, which, of course, that's built into the role. So, But that, obviously, is something that um, is wonderful uh, just in terms of the continuity. Now, another thing I wouldn't have, wouldn't have thought to mention, but it's very, very pertinent, is that... Um, we have had our facilities all over all over campus. We are we are struggling absolutely to kind of pull it all together into one spot instead of having the writing center over here and the speaking center over here. ITS is actually still in a separate building across the street. My office is in the math and science building and always has been from MERS time. And I'm alone. I'm just there with the faculty in the same floor, which is fabulous in terms of building relationships and them seeing me as a partner. I mean, literally half the stuff that I find out that I need to do is from walking down the hallway and crossing someone in the hallway says, oh, I hate to bother you, but... Um, and Davidson faculty really are like that in many ways. They're, they are not demanding. They don't treat me as a service person. They really you know, treat me as a colleague. So, But it's not so great in terms of what I know about the library, which is virtually nothing. I mean, up until the last year or so because I, ne I don't interact with the library. I mean, I'm over here in this math and science building. Um, I go over to IT quite a bit because that's where my deep end support is, you know, the networking people and um, all the experts in some of the areas, but I very rarely have gone over to the library, so. As I uh, thought about how I might want to present this, um, I actually thought that understanding how we got through some of the barriers that we got through would be pertinent. Um, I'm flabbergasted that somebody founded a uh, um, teaching and learning center in 2000 because we're so far behind that, that model, but I thought it would be pertinent to show kind of some of the things, some of the catalysts in our, our organization that led to some of the breakthroughs that we've had, mm -hmm. to the extent that we've had them. Um, our first center was actually, oh, and the other thing is I thought it would be, I've never used one of these timeline applications. Um, certainly, I don't think they're very conducive to presentations, but um, this is something I've supported with the students, so I thought it would be kind of cool because as I researched kind of what I was going to present, I, I realized it really came back to being a very chronological thing. This event happened, which led us to this. This event happened, which led us to this. So, so our first center was a writing center, clearly focused towards students only back in the mid-90s. Um, and then there is a long gap so, so really from 95, I don't think the next event happened until, and I think I can actually click down here, but it tends to jump around quite a bit. Long gap. <laughs> Not a whole lot happened. <laughs> 2003, 2004. Um, 
We started a second center, the speaking center, again focused towards students exclusively, different part of campus. Mm -hmm. um, if, typically these have been affiliated with um, specific faculty members who help coordinate and run them. I don't know all that much about them, or at least the way they used to be. Uh, and that was in 2005. And then things pick up the pace a little bit. I started in 2000, you know, key events in the time. <laughs> this is really just to show you where my personal experience comes in. And plus, there was a long gap in the timelines. Okay. So Davidson Trust, I don't know if you've heard of this, and you, it's surprising that you'd think it would be on here, but um, Davidson Trust is where Davidson decided that their students were not going to be prevented from coming to Davidson if they couldn't afford it. It was an, our attempt to to um, create a program where people would not graduate with $20,000 debt mm -hmm. and they would not um, avoid applying to Davidson because they know that we're so expensive. And the reason that it's on this timeline, which again, I probably never would have thought of, is that when this was announced, um, some people that were thinking ahead realized this was going to change the characteristics of our student body. And specifically, they, uh, I think that they anticipated that we were going to get a lot more first-generation college students and probably a lot more foreign students in which English would be their second language. And so they were smart enough to realize that this was going to not only affect the, the student support structure that we put in, in terms of writing center, speaking center, but also faculty, because faculty would not necessarily have the skills or knowledge as to how to um, build the, the, uh, their course structures and their uh, learning around this different type of student. And that actually started to give us a little bit of an impetus in terms of levering the um, college to start thinking about investing in teaching and learning. Um, we got a new president, uh, and there's really not a whole lot of turnover in the presidency of Davidson typically. Um, Thomas Ross came actually right around when the financial meltdown happened and he was he was unbelievable in terms of the way he handled that at Davidson and also the way he leveraged that trauma, external trauma, to make change happen. And one of the very first things he did was um, put in place this incredibly um, aggressive strategic planning process where they created these, um, and I, this sounds so far afield from Center and Center of Teaching and Learning, but it really does help understand how we got there. Um, and what he did was he created a series of teams that drew in people from every, I mean, I was on several teams with all these people from other areas that I never would have met otherwise. Um, and these, these were very time intensive. I mean, you had to commit to going to these meetings for you know, an hour once a week, and if you were on several teams, I mean, it seemed like everybody was drawn into this extensive investment in, in the strategic plan. One of the things that, um, that was critical was that there was a team called the Teaching and Learning Team that was a strategic, strategic planning team about the future of teaching and learning and what we needed to do. Um, and on that uh, team was a very influential faculty member and Krista. So there was IT, ITG support or input into that. And she was one of the driving members along with the faculty member who I mentioned who was a former um, biology professor, uh, Vernon Case, which may, some of you may know. We also had applied and received a grant from HHMI to create a math and science center, and that happened kind of at the same time. We got that grant a little bit after the strategic planning started. Um, strategic plan was approved a year and a half later. Um, we actually had you know, we hired somebody to come in as the head of the, of the Math and Science Center. They started to create implementation teams um, for the approved strategic plan, one of which, again, was the teaching and learning group or team. And then came the second major trauma, which is that Thomas Ross was hired by the UNC statewide system to take over their program. And so we lost our president, which doesn't happen that often to Davidson. They tend to be long timers, he was a Davidson grad, you know, his, his kids went to Davidson, his father went to Abbey, who knows? But that's the kind of, um, that was the kind of expectation that was kind of there, the culture of he was going to be there for a long time. 
Um, but that implementation team wrote a document that became the framework, and I actually have a copy of it if any of you want to see it, the framework for what was created in the CTL. And it included things like the structure of the organization, it included facilities that were required, staffing requirements, uh, broken into phase one and phase two. Again, we're still kind of in the financial meltdown at this point, so although there was budget allocated, clearly we couldn't get everything that we wanted. Um, and then they also announced a administrative restructuring where they actually created an associate dean of teaching, learning, and something. I can't remember exactly what it was called. Associate dean for teaching, learning, and research. Um, and that was this woman who had, was, the, was a biology teacher of many, many years who had been uh, the chair. And she had been on both of those other committees along with uh, the ITG person I mentioned before. We then... Um, can, can you go in and tell us a little bit more about what her responsibilities are? You know, I think everything that we have all been talking about, about the integration, seemed to be... I mean, I don't know the answer to your question, really. Um, but she wrote this document, and, um, you know, the, the, there's a diagram I was going to show, but I didn't get a chance to put it in, but... You know, the Center for Teaching and Learning, and then the two kind of major goals that surround it are faculty development and pedagogical, whatever, and then students. And then there's a whole series of the little components, that all of which we've talked about um, here that could go around the outside. So, but but think things were not moved under her for her supervision or. I don't know. I mean, you still report uh, no, to Mer. No, it's definitely still an ITF. And Mer reports to. Mer reports on the finance. I think so. finance yeah, I think he does. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, he reports to the that. CFO. Okay. Yeah, and actually, I do have a board chart. That was one of the things okay. I brought with me. Okay. So she was there to give a vision of how things should work together, but she wasn't sort of put into a management supervisory role over those things. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know actually okay. whether, whether people report to her or whether so. Okay. But again, I could, we'll, I'll look at that um, org chart with you afterwards and try to figure out the dotted lines. Um, we hired a completely non-traditional Davidson hire. She did not graduate from Davidson and she was a woman. So it was a huge <laughs> breakthrough for us. That was in, that wasn't that long ago, 2011. Um, and during that time, they actually had um, begun and completed phase one renovations, which were in the library, which was a pretty cool thing because the library is a very central part of campus, whereas the speaking center had been over there, mm -hmm. and the writing center had been in the basement of one of the residence halls, and the math and science center had been in this unused up space near one of the public labs. Um, and I supported that for a while because it was math and science. Um, and this was, of course, going to pull it all together. And what the other thing we did, which will be, I think, of interest to Candace, is we really built a room, which was like an experimental classroom of the future, um, that really didn't look that dissimilar in terms of size and structure and what we're, what we're hoping to do with it from what you're looking at. Um, and that was in the library. And I, have, I did bring a bunch of pictures just so you guys can kind of see some of the things we've experimented with. And that happened in, um, it opened in September of 2011, mm -hmm. um, actually right before her inauguration. And then, kind of, these are all just kind of steps that have happened that we've learned um, along the way since it's been opened. Um, that one room, which we call Studio D, Studio Davidson, is not something that, it's not a classroom that just gets assigned. Uh, like other classrooms on campus. Originally, we just kind of let it happen organically. People would say, hey, I mean, you know, can I come over and teach a couple classes in that room? Um, there were no, the first, uh, the fall, the fall of 2012, no, I'm sorry, 2011, there were no classes that met every regularly scheduled session. They came in, in and out at various times to kind of experiment. A lot of events happened. Um, you know, we would have a lot of external guest speakers that would come in and that would be the room that would be used because we were trying to get faculty in to see it, to, to spark an interest in using it. It wasn't until 
it started to get um, a little crowded that we kind of put into place a proposal process for the next year. Like, if you want to use it, submit a proposal to us, tell us why you want to use it, what about the way that you're going to try to change teaching your course would fit with this space, which has very flexible seating, it has very flexible presentation capabilities, um, it has a laptop cart with 32 dual boot Mac Pros, MacBook Pros, so that you could do both Windows and Mac. Um, and then the students that need laptops could grab them, and the students that didn't need them did not have to use them. It's one of the things about Davidson. We don't force anybody to do anything. And I'm not saying that in a totally positive way, because um, standardization has some tremendous benefits. Um, but we don't get those benefits. Um, we also kind of debriefed in the end of that year what we liked about it and what we didn't like about that space. Um, and I think at this point, let me just show a few photos. Um, so you get kind of a sense of where we started from. And um, we actually do have, whoops, we do have a, a desk in the library still. Um, but clearly, the Center for Teaching and Learning is pretty well promoted right off the bat when you walk in. And as you walk down that hallway to the left, there's some, um, oh, the first is this. there's a bunch of smaller things. There's small tutoring rooms, there's study rooms, quiet rooms. Uh, they all have presentation equipment in there. I uh, just kind of wanted to give you a sense of some of the surrounding um, facilities. And then, oh, there's the speaking center, which still actually is not, oh yes, this one is, it's a writing center that is only now being moved in. This is the grand opening, um, and that's Carol Cullen actually supporting it, and that was Vernon actually. And then there's Studio D, and this is where, this is a, a photo of Studio D, one wall, and then, then I took a bunch of uh, photos that were taken the very first semester that some of the faculty were beginning to use the facility. And I'll, I'll use this to kind of point out some of the things. That's one of the MacBook Pros. You can see that on the background there's a short throw projector. Big mistake. Hmm. Big mistake because the quality of that projection was so out of date within a year that we had had external speakers come in and we would be embarrassed because the, literally the quality of the presentation was of the, of the projector was just not up to snuff. Um, this room also did have the capability of doing lecture capture, although I don't think anybody did it the first year, which kind of makes sense because we didn't have regularly scheduled classes. Consequently, the whole concept of an automated lecture capture didn't really make sense. I know we recorded some, um, some uh, events and some presentations, but it wasn't, we weren't taking advantage of it. Uh, but you'll notice, one of the things I want you to notice a little bit also as these as I go through some of these photos is notice how the tables are aligned because it's all over the place. So this is one of our psych professors and there was white um, whiteboards around three, three quarters of the room and then a projector up front. You can see the laptop cart, one of those laptop carts in the background. So in this particular case, it, it didn't really look like the professor had organized anything specifically. <coughs> but there's small groups in some cases, um, and then there's also just students working separately in some cases. Notice in the background, this is actually, um, in the library we have a lot of uh, dual boot iMacs that are just one of the public lab spaces on campus, and that's what's actually in the background there. With clear windows, which is kind of interesting because you do feel like you're in a fishbowl a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but it clearly opens up the room quite a bit. One of the things I've noticed, because I support some of the classes that are in there quite a bit, is the professor will start leaving the door open. You know, it's a disaster because you have to close that door because it just, the uh, reverberation through the library is very disruptive. Oops. Oh, left that in because that was a, an iMac. We actually had a couple of, um, Murr bought a couple of, uh, I think you bought about 24 IMAX and tried to stimulate some interest in professors to try something different. And so some of the professors that were in Studio D the first year were some of the same professors that were attempting to do things on, the, on tablets. And I just want to show you, that's what that, Mac, that card looks. Um, just as a little aside, um, they drive me nuts 
because the concept of everybody coming in and grabbing a different random laptop every class means that the first time that you log in this laptop is the first time that you've logged in on that machine, which means the profile needs to be created, mm -hmm. which means that the login is interminable. Not to mention if there's any wireless issues because if you can't authenticate against the server, then you can't log in anyway, and so you get blocked. So what we ended up doing is um, creating local accounts on both the Mac and Windows side just as a backup in case when you log in, you can't log in under your account. And it's just, that's not great because then you see what whatever the person ahead of you left behind. Mm -hmm. um, now we have solved almost all of the wireless problems. It seems very consistent now, although there's always hiccups in the, um, in the wireless occasionally. And so if you're counting on it in the class, it's, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we had done in the first year, and this is kind of getting into that debriefing that I was talking about after the first year, was we also didn't have a um, dedicated machine up in front. So the instructor had to grab a laptop. Now that, having taught in there, that was terrible because I wanted to have something where the desktop looked the same as it did the day before or the week before. And so you know, I would start getting in early to make sure I got number three because you know, that was the one I wanted because I knew that that's what I'd used day before yesterday. So, um, and that was something that, that came up in the debrief as well. We also had on the front, okay, now, this is actually time for me to go back to the timeline real quick. So these were some of the tweaks that we did for year two. We updated the Crestron because I guess there wasn't enough um, inputs. This is from Kristen. We also switched it to fully digital. The lighting turned out to not be bright enough. Mm -hmm. And so we really had to improve our writing. Um, we kept holding events. Every spring we do a technology showcase, which is actually a poster session with some demos. But we're trying to get at faculty to get in more, you know, to see it, trying to stimulate uh, interest. Put in some tweaks for year two, but not a lot because there was no budget for it. You know, we had blown the wad on the first big investment, and so there was a small amount of tweaking available in, in second year, but not everything that we wanted to do. Second year was a, a more limited number of faculty, but some used it all year. Um, and the deal that they had was, and, I'll, and actually, I'll, I'll go over a little bit of what we asked for in our proposal. But the deal was that they had to try some new things. They had to innovate. And they had to agree to a debriefing with us at the end of the semester. And I think, especially for some of the classes that use the iPad, they had to agree that the students um, had to go through a pretty extensive either survey or debriefing afterwards to try to figure out what worked and what didn't work. Yeah. I was wondering, for uh, getting faculty to do these, Innovative teaching. Mm -hmm. um, do you do a student evaluations still count for that class that semester, or do you? Mm. Throw actually, that's a great question. I, I actually don't know. Okay. I actually don't know. That's a really great question. Can I, can I add to that? So. We've had some faculty try the flip model, <coughs> and their evaluations were horrible. Yeah. Students hated it, and so our administration is looking at now how do we. Yeah, we want to encourage innovation, but how do we look, you know, beyond yeah. the evaluation? And you know, I would imagine that they the could that. Yeah, because was, otherwise that would really discourage mm -hmm. trying something new if mm -hmm. it was going to come back and bite you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was speaking with uh, Rebecca Frost Davis, and mm -hmm. where she's now at, um, if a faculty member is going to do it, like innovate with technology in the classroom, um, student evaluations will not count for the mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. So it's the... Mm -hmm. I'll give you a really good example. One of the chemistry faculty taught there that this year using iPads. And her, her real objective was, um, it, it was a chemistry lab class, and her one of the dreads of her life was these dreaded lab notebooks. Not to mention the students' mm -hmm. dreads, but you know she would have to grade these mm -hmm. lab notebooks every two weeks or something. She'd take this big stack home. And so she found on an iPad the, um, the electronic version of the lab notebook where the students could actually be in the lab next to the computer um, that was like maybe taking measurements of the concentration <coughs> of something. And they would be actually capturing these right on the fly in their uh, iPad rather than having to go back and transcribe it later. Because she said it's absolutely typical of a student to wait until the last minute and then to try to take an entire semester's worth of information and transcribe it you know, in, in a week. And it, she thought it was horrible for them, it was horrible for me. And so she attempted to use this online 
lab notebook, which was a disaster mm -hmm. because the thing was buggy. Mm -hmm. And so students halfway through the semester, a couple of them crashed, lost everything. Oh. And so then she had to go to the backup, which was to print out your electronic lab notebook just in case. And of course, that the, think about the evaluations for that class. I mean, those students mm -hmm. probably were you know, devastated by the amount of stuff that they lost. So, so obviously that one didn't, didn't pan out. And I guess the, the moral of the story there is that sort of like the, you know, never go with the point .0 version of anything. Mm -hmm. You know, wait until it's mm -hmm. service oh, really? pack one or whatever. Um, and, and these iPad apps especially, uh, they clearly were not ready for prime time in all cases. So, um. Now, for, for the, this year that we just started, um, we put in place even a more rigorous proposal um, structure where we really were looking for faculty that could um, describe what they were trying to do pedagogically and how this room was going to support that. And then that became a part of the process. And then the truth is, um, I was talking to some of you about our, we're doing a MOOC at the moment, and we, again, had proposals for that, but we kind of knew who were going to apply, and we kind of knew who the strongest applicants were probably going to be. It's very similar for Studio D. You know, there are faculty that over the years have proved to be innovators and try new things, and so we kind of expected and knew that we were going to get proposals from some of them, which we did. And they tended to be the ones who were picked because they had actually gone through some of those pains in attempting to do it in space that wasn't quite as uh, nice as this. So, um, and there were probably 50% math and science because they tended to be much more quantitative and some of them are also very, very innovative in terms of the way that they approach how they want to teach um, some of the core science skills. This year we did do some major innovations this past summer, um, including Resolving the, we had one of those, uh, a whiteboard in front that you know you could control, you could write on it and control it with one of those things. It was a disaster. It was so buggy. There were so many issues with trying to pen, uh, pair the pen with the mm -hmm. laptop that was up front, which of course was a different laptop every time. Mm -hmm. um, although mm -hmm. the, the, we quickly re uh, realized that we had to install the drivers and pair on every single one of those laptops. Uh, but also the um, the whiteboards. Um, we decided that we wanted more flexibility in presentations. Um, and I can show you some of the pictures, and it's probably better to talk through uh, by looking at some of the innovations. So we now put in a much, much nicer uh, projection mechanism. These are all sharp monitors, which are touch screen, touch monitors, and they're crystal clear, um, high res, crystal clear. Uh, all four walls. Um, so any one of these four walls, you can hook up a laptop or whatever, a student or one of ours, to project in small groups. Um, the Crestron, you guys, I think some of you are very familiar with this. The Crestron is amazing. You know, you can tell it any input to project anywhere. So mm -hmm. if group number two is over here on this wall projecting something, you know, the professor can just go up with the Crestron and say, project the inputs from display two to everybody in the room. It's pretty cool. Um, but there's been lots of snafus. One of the things I asked you as we were walking around last night was, do you have somebody that hangs around your new facility because of all the support needs? We pretty much have to have somebody hanging out nearby when faculty are in here because there's so many technical things that seem to just have little peculiarities. Um, we have the ability to, for a faculty member to have a, um, a wireless Mac that can be projected wirelessly to the monitors. But that requires each one of these to have a little Mac Mini and an Apple TV, because that's the mechanism by which your wireless can be thrown. Um, you know, that's just, that's an, I'm not sure that anybody except for maybe one or two professors have even attempted this. Um, we found out that the new high-res sharp monitors um, only support some of the really cool things in terms of um, using the annotation, you know, showing a PowerPoint and drawing something on top of it and capturing all that. Only support that in a certain resolution, which oh. guess what? Exceeded the resolution of those MacBook Pros that we had mm -hmm. that we didn't realize because they were they were actually pretty pretty high res MacBook Pros, but they weren't like I don't think they were 1080p. They might have been just prior to that. 
And so then we had to put little Max Minis on each of those three monitors because that was the only way that we could take advantage of the capabilities. Um, the, the MacBooks get refreshed on a, these particular MacBooks get refreshed on a three year cycle, which is going to be next summer. Um, and this is also the room that has um, the Echo 360 camera. Uh, I don't know if that's shown in any of the other photos. Yeah, so there's the Echo 360 camera in the upper left. Um, so there's still quite a bit of whiteboard space, um, but now there's uh, a lot more ability of small group and small group presentations to happen. Um, but that's always not so easy either. You know, if you have a laptop that a student brings in, like if you brought that in to hook it up, you know, that's different from a Mac. That's different from a um, ThinkPad. You know, every projector is, is a little bit different. The Macs typically never know that they're supposed to mirror. Um, so, that, and that's what I mean by kind of hanging around. Is anyone doing projecting iPads on Tether through the Mac Mini? Because that's a big deal at firm. Right. Well, I think that's what they're trying through the Apple TV right. thing. But I'm not sure this semester that any of the faculty are, are using iPads. And, and there's this particular no, semester. And there's no issue with on, on y'all's network with Bonjour interrupting the security uh, blog. You probably know that's more. A big topic around campus. Okay. So okay. on the small call list serve a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So far, we haven't done so yet. We do not allow propagation of the Bonjour across okay, the VLANs. Yeah. But, but there are appliances, all the major brands, mm -hmm. Cisco, Roomba, and whatever, mm -hmm. have appliances yet. You can buy it and allow some propagation across. Right. And we're looking into those right now. So what, what's the problem? Is that there was a bunch of iMacs in the room, or iPads in the room, it can't pull out. Apple iPads. uses a protocol right. that they have to discover each other. It's very noisy. And if, yeah. you know, yeah. if you don't control the traffic, you network with packets, and which may be why we have trouble logging into the wireless. Yeah, probably, yes, probably why. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they just don't allow a set of broke networks in every classroom, I'm sure why. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the other thing about touch screens, um, and I'm speaking as a short person, is, is that I've always found touch screens really difficult because um, if they're mounted low enough for me, right. They really get cut off, yeah. you know, in the head. And University of Richmond, they probably don't even know this, but all the touch screens that were put up while I was there, I they were put up low enough for me. Uh -huh. I was the person who walked around to the rooms and put up my hand and said, "Okay, this has to be at the top. <laughs> this is the top of the screen." Right? That's why it's a pad approved. Yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> and, and, and it's crazy, but Paul, no, you would not think of it because you are no. so much taller than I am, both you know in height and in length of arm. Right. But I, I'm looking at that at that picture and thinking mm -hmm. I can only get to the middle of that touch screen. Mm -hmm. that, that, that right? There's always the you got to put yourself in the other person's yeah. shoes. Um, classic yeah. example is you design this beautiful Moodle page on your widescreen monitor. Yeah. And then you go look at a student looking at it on a laptop at 800 by 600 resolution, you realize that's not what I designed. Yeah. yeah. So you have to take, take that into account. Yeah. Um, wow. Notice that the, the tables here are all organized in a nice, yeah, go ahead. I was going to, you were talking about having uh, tech support there. And, um, I can say that, can you say that they state created a similar kind of classroom you know, many years ago? And the whole idea was tech support is guaranteed. So to get the faculty members to use it and to experiment, that's exactly what they've done. And you were allowed to, if you apply, to teach there for a year. And if you wanted to keep teaching in that technology, hopefully you've gotten, then they were willing to turn around and start installing some of that technology mm -hmm. in other classrooms for you to migrate. But the interesting part was the guarantee of tech support. Come in and experiment, and you won't look like a fool, and somebody will be there to help you with every step of the way. But don't you guarantee that at your school? Well, I think you can turn around and do that, but for these spaces, as he was saying, you know, it sort of needs somebody there. It became the carrot to say, you plan it with somebody there mm -hmm. so that they don't have to worry about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I give faculty that guarantee, yeah. you know, that don't worry, if you want us there, we'll be there, yeah. right? And right now we're we're uh, we're sort of in a little bit of a fight uh, because the instructional technologists used to be the people who provided that, and they're so busy now that we're now having to look at our user services group, our help desk and classroom tech, and we're saying to them, 
you guys have to start stepping in and doing that because the instructional technologists don't have the time anymore. And, and that's a new thinking for them. And, and rightly so, they're coming back to me and saying, well, why do you think I have the time? You know, I don't have the time either. And I'm like, yeah, I know you don't, but you're going to do it anyways. Because <laughs> I have to, you know, I have to protect the, the instructional technologists to yeah. be out there with right. the faculty. Yeah. Well, so it's a, it's a big struggle right now for us. Yeah, time is, time is always an issue. I mean, I'm swamped. Yeah. But one of the things I've realized since I've come here is I also support all the computers that the science uses in all their labs, which is about 250 computers. Oh, yeah, you so I do that in addition to instructional technology. Yeah. And then now I'm on the MOOC team, and I'm the Moodle expert. So, but um, I, Kristen, to her credit, is absolutely looking to move away the technology support side of what I do to to um, someone to someone else, whether it's a, in a different department or like a different support group or whatever. Do you think that there's any chance that STEM staff might be able to fill yeah. a little bit of an edge? Hmm. Yeah, they could. I mean, the um, the problem is, is that, uh, and again, I'm, I'm not. This is not anything that's different for you, but. The computers that I support that are hard are the ones that are used in research when a biologist is trying to track turtles by putting, you know, inter and that's things on it. That, and that's, and that's one off. Uh, the classrooms where the computers are all the same as the ones in the public labs, that's, they're actually pretty easy to support. But it's the weird ones, you know, the physics computers that are still running XP because they're running a 15-year-old uh, uh, instrument. You know, you, you can't, I can't use a campus image for that because there's no more images that are used with XP, but I have to. But we're, we're just starting a new master plan, a classroom master plan. We finished our last one. This one is probably going to be like a five year or less now because you can't really plan much further. But we've talked about having two sets of uh, sandbox classrooms, and we haven't thought at all about really how they're going to be technically supported outside of what is our normal thing, which is like a 10, 15 minute response time. Right multimedia services kind of group. But suddenly right. in this conversation, I'm starting to think, well, maybe we could do something like that just to have someone on site. Right. And I don't know talking. if any of these pictures have it. I'm pretty sure there's going to be at least one that has it. But I want to, I make it sound probably a little worse than it is. Uh, that's just the front control, which by the way, um, the problem with dual boot is that you, if you walk in three minutes before your class starts <laughs> and it's booted into the Mac and you're a Windows user, then you have to restart it. And it sometimes can take you know, a minute, minute and a half to get rebooted. So what we did up in this front, and again, this classroom is kind of our experimental one, is we actually have two Mac minis, one running Windows, one running Mac. So it's an instantaneous switch. Mm -hmm. Now that's not going to solve all the classrooms across campus, but, you know, Mac minis, not that, uh, a Mac mini is almost half the price yeah. of a MacBook Pro, and so, or whatever we're putting in the classroom, so maybe it is a solution that we could do in the future, but I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, I was gonna just blow through some of these. That's Barbara mm -hmm. Lum, by the way, who was on one of your ACS slides yesterday. That's right, Barbara. that's right. She got the emergency She is one of the teachers that are in there. And I wanted to show you a bunch of pictures of what it's like in use. This was like Wednesday night before as I was getting ready to leave after a class. Mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. students running all over the place, tables all over the place. People having dragged in cords like crazy in the lower left to plug extra things in. <laughs> um, there's the lap book or the the cart that people are stuffing notebooks back in. Now, see that window right there? That's actually Kristen's office. It's almost like a. It's not really one way because you can see through it, but it's mostly reflective. So when I say I support this classroom, I'm not sitting there, you know, just twiddling my thumbs. I can actually go in her office and sit down and actually do my email and whatever. But I can also see if a professor suddenly is struggling, or there's no audio for some reason all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. um, I can at least know almost instantly that, that I need to jump up and try to figure it out. So your Echo 360, do you, do you think your faculty are comfortable using it, or do you kind of? Well, I think there's two parts to that. One is um, the automatic recording of lectures and stuff. They don't really do that. I think once it's set up at the beginning of the semester, which I think Kristen did it, I, I don't know how to do that because I haven't done it yet, but in terms of Echo 360 personal capture, which is how you can kind of do your own mm -hmm. in your office, it's actually pretty easy, pretty easy, because I actually taught a, one of the um, things that Barbara did, which is kind of interesting, is 
she actually had me come in and teach the students how to do Echo 360 personal capture. And they all then were doing, quote, you know, quote, lecture capture on their own laptops, which were then all uploaded to a course, which is what it's called in Echo 360, I think, so that people could watch each other's small presentations recorded, which is kind of interesting. I hadn't really thought of students using the personal capture part of it. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Um, I don't know that they're doing anything themselves right. if they're doing the semester long thing. Yeah, that's but um, case, like, they have the idea and we can show you, but then they feel more comfortable with it. If you do it. Yeah. yeah. So just Malcolm just Campbell is one of the professors that's in there this semester, and he's, his lecture capture is because he's showing it to a group of high school teachers from around the state as he, I mean, these are live things, and the professors get to see his. These high school teachers get to see his presentations and, and use them. So he's kind of got a, an outreach community thing along with DACA 360. Um, and actually, I wasn't a part of the evaluation of the proposals, but that very well might have been one of the reasons he was selected, was because he was going to use ECHO 360 in, in that, that way, which is very innovative. <clears throat> I only have a couple more, I think. Um, now, this is actually not Studio D. This is that wall. Studio D's on the other side. So there's actually two rooms. They're fairly large, same furniture. Um, tables are a little bit different, but this is like a, I think it's called the group tutoring room. So it actually has a pretty good presentation capability as well, um, but it's not used for regularly scheduled classrooms. It's more used for small group work. Um, and it does not have the same technology as the other room. So, um, I think there's one more picture. This is the second group tutoring room. So where we are now is, uh, this is the third year using the new technology. A lot of it's trial and error. I mean, actually, what, that's what we're using this classroom for, is to try out things that could potentially make their way into classroom space across campus as it's, as it's uh, renovated and improved over time. Um, I mentioned this to a couple people a few days ago, a couple days ago as we were wondering, but Davidson, during the uh, Thomas Ross strategic plan era, added, um, I don't know how many students exactly, but it's in the neighborhood of 100. And that was because, you know, we were financially strapped. Um, we had to build new dorms because Davidson is such a highly residential college that they're, it, pretty much every new student that we add, nine out of 10, end up living on campus. So, so that dorm space didn't exist. Um, shoot, I lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? You were gonna talk about adding seats into your classrooms. Yes. So those students come in and they have, it's a liberal arts college, they have lab requirements, just like all the other students that we had. And that means that all of a sudden all the lab classes in physics, chemistry, and biology had more students that had to take them just in order to graduate, which meant that all of our labs, which um, often are groups of 16, a lot of my labs have eight computers, one projector, and so they have 16 students that are two to a machine. All those labs had either, they either had to add more sections or they had to increase the size of the lab from say 16 to 18 which meant that we were one computer short classes that used to be 20 are now 24 maybe or 24 to 28 and all of a sudden all of our technology oriented classrooms all of the labs that had you know 24 computers now needed 28 and so it had huge ripple effects in terms of technology and and uh, the classrooms, so that's absolutely a struggle, and that I think is one of the reasons that Studio P is really useful because it gives us a chance to try out some different mechanisms for handling larger groups. This has we have 32 laptops in that cart, so this can handle up to 32 students. Um, the faculty love this room. I mean, almost without a, with with no exceptions, um, people just absolutely had no idea the impact that all those movable, simple tables um, had on the amount of group work that they can do and the quality of the group work and the presentations through just connecting it to the side things. Um, so the faculty now are, there's far more demand for that room than there are spaces available. It's now pretty much full, um, except for events that we still schedule in. And consequently, the whole proposal mechanism is coming under a lot more scrutiny now in terms of we have to be really careful about the selection process and so forth. 
but I think also we're starting to get some really good ideas about what um, some of the classrooms of the future can look like because the, the flexibility of the furniture, for example, is that's like a must now because of the, the impact that the faculty have told us that it has on the way that they teach. Um, in fact, one of the things that kind of organically happened was the teachers will sometimes come in and the very first thing the students see is a little PowerPoint that shows them how the faculty want the room set up. So it'll have like a diagram with the way that the faculty wants the tables that day. And the students then get it all done. Um, and then when everybody comes in, they just sit down. It's pretty cool. And they started sharing. You know, somebody came in and said, that's a great idea. And so they borrowed that you know, PowerPoint from the professor ahead of them. So. I was about to ask you almost that very question because we have a lot of flexible rooms and uh, we have that uh, conflict between faculty of you know, different classes about kind of what should be the default configuration right. and, mm -hmm. and what yeah. And so we're looking at that in terms of room scheduling. Well, we have a default at the beginning of the day, but there's no default during the day <laughs> sure. because there's not, there's not enough time at the end of a class for a faculty mm -hmm. member to to return it to a default, which the next person is probably going to change anyway. So the students are doing it, which is pretty cool. And the students are supposed to return the laptops. So we occasionally have one disappear, but it's pretty easy to track down usually. So Paul, how yeah. is this flowing out? Is your group meeting with a facilities group to change the way that they're ordering classroom furniture? Mm -hmm. No. The way they're thinking about the design as you need to update a classroom? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have not been a part of, of those meetings, but I you know, know for sure that uh, one of the people that's in our group is uh, the classroom support person, the person that goes around and makes sure that uh, classroom emergency <coughs> projectors are not working. She's absolutely involved on that group, as is Kristen, my boss. So we absolutely have input into that. I don't know much beyond that, though. It's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's going to be a really interesting one to go through. I know at a previous, my previous institution, um, we were working with Steel Case. So we started working with their node chairs, these wonderful chairs that can make tables. And by working with the facilities committee, those are now replacing all the desks. So every time they go through, try, even just upgrading the desk or the tablet chairs or whatever they had in classroom. <laughs> But it was all based on a similar kind of thing like you all have done. Faculty beginning to work with this furniture and then saying, how do you get the attention of facilities? Um, get this thinking that like, we're not even talking about technology here. We want to talk about furniture. Mm -hmm. um, this was phase one. Uh, we still don't have all of the centers in this facility that, that we wanted. Um, I'm still, for example, over in the Math and Science building, whereas two or three of the other ITG folks have now moved in to the library area. Uh, we brought over the speaking center, but I think the writing center has not formally been moved in yet. Um, we have uh, tutors, and they actually still support mostly in another part of campus because that's where uh, like the media computers are, the ones that are used for the high-end video editing and audio editing. Um, just because there's not a big enough classroom. Uh, and they can't use the MacBook Pros for the high-end media work. So that's still elsewhere. So, I mean, there's still a long way to go in terms of really centralizing it. Um, what's really cool is that the amount of overlap with Jonathan's presentation this morning and, and what I was planning on talking about, that was really kind of neat because we're clearly thinking the same way, that you know there's got to be a much closer interaction. Would you move in if you could? If they had a spot for you, would you move in, or do you want to stay where you are? Well, I love to be. I love where I am now, right, mixed in among the faculty. And I mean, there's, there's nobody will argue that that's not a really powerful thing. Mm -hmm. What's cool is that um, what you talked about in your new science building, we have plans for a massive new science building that's going to replace one of our oldest chemistry buildings. And they're doing the same thing. You know, they're putting in physics, not physics actually. They're physics and math are going to be separate, but. Chemistry, biology, psychology, IT, uh, psychology, physics, biology, they're all almost like alternating offices. Um, and it's really kind of a neat thing that they're, that's, that's the plan currently to do that now. And they're going to incorporate IT well, alternate a, offices in, within that? Not, 
Well, my office was still in there. Your office. But to be honest, I'll bet you that doesn't happen because I really do think that I'll end up being more in a in a CTL area along with um, some of the library. That's that's a, and that's one of the things I've been thinking about in here. As, I mean, I love where I am, but I also begin to see that that's creating a little bit of a silo thing because I certainly am not in, as involved with the librarians as I should. So. I was going to say, I think that's a really interesting question for all of us. Well, I, I am not, as Melanie well knows. So we have some IT people in one building, everybody else is in the library, and I'm not in either building. I'm in a faculty building. Mm -hmm. And so I get exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It is the constant hallway conversations and faculty coming into my office. And so this year I sort of thought, should I go down there? I mean, what it means is I have to physically get myself to the library and to the IT space to see my staff. But I think for all of us, that's a that's a real challenge. Do you stay with your peeps, right. <laughs> more or less, and sort of learning as the hallway conversations are so great right. from all of us, mm -hmm. or does it make more sense to be closer to where the faculty are and where they're doing things for those conversations? Right. Well, Kristen, my boss, was actually pretty vehement about me moving in to the library with mm -hmm. her. And I was kind of, you know, I don't have the same, pers I have a little bit more of the, her perspective now right. um, than I did then because I've come to a meeting like this, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was also, she was cognizant <coughs> of what I was saying too, is that it hate, I need to give up that, that really great relationship that I've been able to build over the years. But, uh, but I can see her point of view. And I think as, as new facilities are built, I think it's inevitable that there will be a, a separation in some ways. I don't think I'll be in the faculty building. Well, I think it's a very interesting, it would be interesting in contrast to look at a large R1 institution. Mm -hmm. So the kinds of things that we're talking about doing here are not centralized. They're broken down by colleges or mm -hmm. by departments, and those people are in those spaces mm -hmm. because they're right, they're right next to the faculty. So I think for us as a smaller institution, it is this sort of fascinating how do you, how do you yeah, but do there's that? a lot of inefficiencies in that as well from, from, you know, those colleges are always fighting with central IT because, you know, right. and we don't have those kind of fights because we're small and, and Well, and I of. think central IT provides far more of the infrastructure now yeah. those colleges, but the experimentation and the innovation, yeah. particularly there, is built on that trusting relationship. So I just find this a very interesting question for all of us to say. Where do you set for the best sort of informal transfer of knowledge and building trust relationships? Well, I moved about 18 months ago. I moved uh, about 0.3 miles from here, actually, in a building that is on very much the edge of campus. We, uh, academic computing and the help desk is in the library, but the rest of IT is in the last building on campus, which is literally 0.3 miles from here. Um, and, um, and so what I do is I take my laptop and I place myself in different places around campus in between meetings. So sometimes I'm sitting right. in the Science Center and sometimes I'm sitting in the library and sometimes I'm sitting outside the business school and sometimes, you know, and, um, and that probably helps to be in Florida because I can be outside a lot you know, in courtyard areas of buildings, but that's how I am getting over the fact that right. my office is 0.3 miles from campus, mm -hmm. um, is I sit with my laptop <coughs> in Absolutely other locations. Absolutely something that Kristen's a big believer right. in, the, the concept of the floating office or not, yeah. not yeah. tethered to a specific place. Yeah. What did you think of the, of the space in terms of what you were looking at? I mean, that I, I, well, I was pretty impressed with it. I think our reference librarian who does the majority of the research um, instruction would be interested in. And I like the fact that you have that it's a classroom per se. I, I know our library is very protective of the space, so we'll never be a full, hey, we can reserve it for classroom, especially with external orientation. But I like the idea of bringing in a new technology money faculty experience. Well, you can get the you can get the Mac and the Windows mm -hmm. and the yeah. flexibility using mm -hmm. the MacBook Pro yeah. laptop approach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
has some flaws for sure. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't do a high-end video editing, I don't yeah. think. We are, our small video editing lab in the CTL by our theater is 10 computers. Um, when we hired, well, when we're in the process of hiring this new person or new position, we didn't have space. So now in this old space where my office or other instructional tech in our community-based learning, our CTL director is down the hall in a different space that got renovated because we needed a better space. So now they're going to put up more walls. So it'll be interesting to see, and I didn't take pictures of our CTL area. We're in the basement of the library. So it's interesting. IT is on the complete end, right? We're not even connected. You can't get to the library. I mean, unless you go down the front stairs. But if you're in the library, you cannot get to the CTL. You have to go out the library, down the front steps, and get. So there's not, and when we were under the library before the, the change happened, there was not any, I mean, you can't get to us. So it confused students. We still get a lot of students with help desk questions, and it's IT, and so it's, it's the conversation, too, that you mentioned, Pam, of where everybody would exist and stuff. Um, I think our new ITS director is in the process of changing the help desk, but they are so used to working in silos that hopefully now we can kind of work together a little bit more. But no, I, I took a lot of notes. I made some contacts, yeah. Okay, so